The first and the last time that I ever went to the Starbucks was with my friend Nate. He told me that the coffee there is great and that I can befriend some girls in there, though the thing with Nate was that it was all about the girls for him, and I didn't care much about that, at least not until I actually left for college. My school were just over, and Nate was already starting the first year of college. He was a year older than me, and he was already settling into the college, and I was about to join him in the same college a year later, and Nate always told me, with girls, you want to be experienced as you can, because college is rough as an inexperienced person. And when I often asked him, isn't college for studies? And he would just say, yes, if you want to be a doctor or something, but even nerds need to have a good time in there. And even though every time he opened his mouth, he sounded like an idiot, inside he was actually a very caring and generous man, and a great friend on top of that. To top it all off, he was an A student and have gotten into all Ivy League colleges but ignore them. He was a legend to us, and that is why I looked up to him. He was a great mentor regardless of that shallow image that he tried to show often. Our friendship was much more than I had with everyone who was in my class, so I hang out with Nate often. Nate was the kind of person you would think would be very communist on the edge, kind of the guy, but with all the things considered, he was very much into Starbucks, and it was the same Starbucks that he would go to every time. It was weird at first when I thought about it, and then I realized that it wasn't actually the coffee that he was interested in. As a matter of fact, it was the girl who made it. Nate was in love with this girl who worked at the Starbucks, and he often visited the place because of the girl. At first you wouldn't know that he was infatuated by her, but the frequent visits and the occasional blushing when she was around made it certain that Nate wasn't at the place for the sake of coffee. It was the first time that I saw Nate acting weird and underconfident. You wouldn't cross him as someone who would be this blushing and so quiet. It was out of ordinary for him to act in such a way. But it was Nate. He was obsessive in everything he did. And this felt like one of those occasions. Every single time we went to the Starbucks, he would line up and switch lines when she wasn't the one serving the coffee. Then one day when we were sitting, I said to Nate, Come on, man. You have to ask her out. You're freaking Nate. You're the boss, man. And Nate looked at me as he wanted to get back the confidence that he was losing and decided that he will ask the girl out. And he did. Her name was Natalie. And they were Nate and Natalie and looked so good together. But they were meant to be together. They were pretty much in love. And now that Nate had Natalie, he would spend much less time. Nate even thanked me when they got together as if I did everything. Nate and Natalie were going perfectly, and now we would hang out more in the Starbucks and get more and more free coffees. They were all good and tight, when one day, something happened that forever changed everything. It was the usual Friday night, and we were all at the Starbucks. Nate was sitting around, and Natalie was waiting for the shift to get over, and then from the front gate, the guy came in. His name was Michael. Michael was one of those quiet kids that always had a thing for Natalie. He came inside and straight away came over to our table and said to Nate, You're not good enough for Natalie. You'll never be. And you try, I will make sure you die. And then Nate said, All right, man, and then shrugged him off. But that must have pissed off Michael, because the next thing he did was took the gun out and then shot Nate in his chest. There was nothing but silence. Nate's blood spattered across my face, and I was in shock of everything. And Nate was lying lifeless, and I was in complete trauma of losing my friend. And then that was the day that I last entered the Starbucks. There are still flashbacks of the incident that keep me awake in the night. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. At around 5.15 a.m. on the morning of July 6, 1997, a Starbucks employee arrived at work to open up the Wisconsin Avenue Northwest branch of the world-famous coffee company. Situated just north of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., there was a lot of work to be done before the morning rush, and the employee in question had yet to imbibe their morning espresso to really kick them into gear. So by their own admission, 
They were pretty groggy by the time they headed out back to one of the freezer units, intending to fetch some of the breakfast pastries that will go on sale that morning. But when the overtired staff member crapped open the freezer unit, inside was the frozen lifeless corpse of 25-year-old night manager Mary Catherine Mahoney, along with the bodies of 18-year-olds Emery Allen Evans and Aaron David Goodrich. Although they weren't always on the safe shift pattern, the employees knew his slain co-workers well, and the horror of witnessing their frozen, discolored cadavers was almost too much to bear. They raced out of the Starbucks and flagged down a bus driver who was only just beginning his morning route, and given how they could have called 911 from the on-site telephone, running to find the comfort of another living person is very telling of this person's distraught state of mind. Within five minutes of the initial 911 call, police were on the scene and taking stock of the situation. All three employees had obviously been herded into the rear freezer units before being shot execution style. But what initially confused the investigation was that not a single cent was missing from the Starbucks. If the motivation wasn't robbery, then it looked a lot like a brutally well-executed, targeted killing. But why on earth would someone ambush and murder three coffee shop employees during their routine night shift would made the murders on the more shocking was that Georgetown had been traditionally a low-crime area of Washington, D.C., with local district council member Jack Evans saying to have a triple homicide anywhere in the District of Columbia is an unusual event. But to have a triple homicide in Georgetown is extraordinary, and this has never been a place where crime has been a problem. Over the course of that balmy July morning, scores of blue uniformed officials made their way to the scene to look for evidence outside the split-level brown brick store. Homicide detectives and forensic technicians alike poured over the scene for hours on end after the bodies were found working inside and outside the building adorned with the familiar green and black logo. They dusted doors for fingerprints, searched the store, and took statements from local residents in the hopes of piecing together what had happened. But it was only when Mary Mahoney, his car was examined, that further evidence was found, evidence which indicated that the murderers were no random attack inside the car was spotless, Safer would look like signs that Mahoney had recently spent time playing with a pet, a dirty tennis ball, a plastic chew toy, a dog's brush, and a red cow. The only possible indication that something had gone awry was a flat tire on the front passenger side of the car, evidence that her attacker had made provisions to prevent her from fleeing. Mary was special. A mother later said she had an enormous heart. She probably would have compassion for the person who killed her. When she moved to Washington several years prior, Mary would jog alone an hour before daybreak, never worrying about being assaulted or attacked. She adored animals, particularly horses, and even took in Mary Lou, her sister Molly's toothless black and white alley cat. She attended various New York colleges before graduating with honors from Townsend State University near Baltimore and was a loyal and active Democrat in turning for Bill Clinton when he was first elected and according to her mother. It was a managerial job at Starbucks that really excited Mary. She had been employed by the company for two years and enjoyed being the manager. She was often seen sweeping the sidewalk in front of the store and obviously took pride in her store. What she didn't enjoy, though, was disciplining employees, particularly one that Mary had recently dismissed for allegedly stealing several hundred dollars. She struggled with the issue before having to fire him. Her mother said, and for a long time, this became Homicide Detective's main theory regarding the Starbucks shooting. The A, despite their hard work and determination, they came up short at every turn, eventually turning to the television law enforcement institution that is America's Most Wanted. After picking the case up, America's Most Wanted stated a thorough recreation of the murders and detailed many of the theories that the police were toying with. They also advised the number of an anonymous hotline, pleading with those with any information to come forward and it seems this appeal struck a nerve with one member of the public, who called in with not only a frightening piece of information, but also 
a rather courageous proposal. In the hours following the broadcast of the Starbucks shootings, a woman called in America's Most Wanted hotline to inform them that she was dating a man who actually knew the shooter firsthand. This mystery person had confessed, even boasted of committing the murders, and on more than one occasion, the couple had initially taken the man's word in pure bluster. But after seeing the Starbucks shooting edition of America's Most Wanted, it became apparent that he might just be telling the truth. The woman then left her name and number so she could be contacted by DC police. And when they did so, she actually agreed to wear a wire for them in the hopes that she could catch a confession on tape. It was then that they learned their suspect's name, Carl D. Cooper. Cooper lived in Prince George's County near Baltimore City and just on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. itself. He was the son of a church deacon who lived with his wife and son, but at the time, he lived anything but the wholesome life of a family guy. At the time of the Starbucks shooting, Cooper was being charged with attempted murder in the 1996 shooting of an off-duty police officer in Prince George County. As far as family's complicity in his crimes, it turned out that it was Cooper's wife that purchased the 9mm handgun that her husband used to shoot the officer. It was the combination of this and his alleged involvement in the Starbucks shooting that led DC police to wiretap Cooper's home phone. He was arrested after making reference to several local shootings, but insisted that a friend of his named Keith Covington had joined him in the Starbucks robbery. It was him that executed the three victims. However, when they caught up with Covington, they discovered he had been recovering from a gunshot wound at the time of the murder, meaning it was highly unlikely that he was ever present on the scene, let alone the ones who have done the shooting. If I killed them, I'd say I killed them, he reportedly said, but that's not me. I'm not saying I'm a saint, but I'm not going to go out and just kill people. You gotta be a dummy or a psycho to do something like that is pure evil. When confronted with the evidence of his lies, Cooper admitted to lying about his so-called friend's involvement because he killed three people and was afraid to go to jail. In the process of trying to avoid the death penalty, Cooper told the investigators he was sticking out the Starbucks for about a month, confirming that he acted alone and fired two guns, the 38 caliber snub-nosed revolver and a 38 caliber pistol. Cooperating heavily due to the ever-looming threat of the death penalty, Cooper confessed to shooting the manager Mary Mahoney when she refused to give him the keys to the safe, which held over $10,000 in cash. When she said no, Cooper shot a warning shot into the ceiling, which sent a terrified Mahoney running into the employee hall. Cooper pursued, caught her, and wrestled with Mahoney over her keys. But when her resistance looked like it would be too much to overcome, they shot her dead. He then shot the two other Starbucks workers at the store, executing one as they survived the attack and attempting to crawl to safety. Cooper later stated that he wanted to put him out of his pain and misery, but it's more than likely this thinly veiled attempt at showing her to conscious was nothing but an attempt to dodge the first death penalty charge in over 30 years. During his trial, even when the relatives of the victim wept openly in court, Cooper remained chillingly composed. He also admitted to murdering 39-year-old security guard named Sandy Griffin during a botched robbery. Cooper had helped Griffin at gunpoint during demanding that the security guard hand over their expensive 40 caliber handgun. But then, fearing Griffin would assault him in the process to defend himself, the serial murderer executed the security guard before quickly fleeing the scene. Cooper admitted to then selling the pistol on the street for $300. Once Cooper was convicted of the Starbucks murders and sentenced to life in prison, Griffin's relatives were no doubt pleased that their loved one's killer had been put away. But they expressed frustrations that had taken three more murders, maybe even more, before the killer had been caught. To them, a lack of urgency in the DC police force had cost three young people their lives and raised many questions regarding their competence and command. If the account of his defense attorney is to be believed, Cooper is nothing more than a career criminal whose shaky temperament and unbridled greed 
caused him to take the lives of the innocent. But time and time again, Cooper had the opportunity to simply take the money and walk away. If he chose not to, he chose to kill people he just didn't need to kill, and he did this on more than one occasion. The first time might have been down to a simple rush of blood to the head, and to genuine possibility that killing the security guard was not part of Cooper's plans. But there's also a possibility that killing him proved to be something of a thrill. The thrill that Cooper wanted to replicate and executing the three Starbucks workers. There's no doubt that locking up killers like Carl Cooper for the rest of their lives makes the world a safer place. The only worry is that there are many more out there just like him. People who've escaped justice for horrific crimes are those who have the same darkness in them, just waiting to boil over. East Belfast in the 1980s was quite a place to grow up. It was the time of bombings, baklavas, and British Army checkpoints. That was all just the violent backdrop of an upbringing that was remarkably similar to that of any other kid my age. I wanted the same things that teenagers everywhere wanted. Drink, girls, nights out, all the sinful adult entertainment that was only barely out of my reach both figuratively and literally when it came to certain top shelf magazines. Obviously, lots of lads my age were getting into secretarian stuff, following fathers or brothers into the IRA or the UVF, or whatever other three-letter acronym thugs were terrorizing our communities all across Northern Ireland during that time. But I can't remember ever giving a monkey's bottom about prods, or taking orphanians or hones. If you all write with me, I was alright with you. Now, gave even less of a toss once I realized that the only thing secretarianism had to offer were prison or premature death. Back then, I didn't care about Irish freedom. All I wanted was the freedom to stay up past half eleven, acting like a buck Egypt without my dark tanning my hide. But whether or not you subscribed to such ideas was irrelevant, even if it wasn't your business. The small but vocal militant minorities made it your business. You just didn't have a say in the matter. The troubles meant there were no shortages of angsty young men around her right loud shouty songs about rampant injustices, and I'd like to think that's why Belfast produced a disproportionately high amount of great punk bands. The Outcast, Stalag 17, The Defects, me and my mates would go to as many of their gigs as we could and the whole scene men drinking, drugs, and liberal young ladies know most of my pals were into the drink. But me and this lad Stacy liked to smoke too, and it wasn't easy to get your hands on. It's in Belfast at the time for a number of reasons, but two people shorten the road, as they say. So one day, me and Stacy are trying to get a hold of some smoke when we hear from a mate of ours that this St. Lucian bloke he knew was selling a load of Moroccan hash he had smuggled in on a boat. We were up to high dough hearing this only problem was that his flat was over in West Belfast. For those who are out of the loop, I tried to keep this simple. I was from East Belfast, the most Protestant side, and this bloke's flat was in West Belfast, the most Catholic side of the city. Under most circumstances, it would not be good for a young Protestant lad like me to go wandering around the West End, but we were desperate for a joint, so we hatched what we thought would be a genius plan to cheat the system. Only where we were going to be able to get across the city was by taxi, but we'd be hard pushed to get a taxi company from either area to drive into enemy territory and back again, so we have a tender down toward Platonic, which was still quite a mixed area at the time then called the taxi company near Glen Road saying we need to get our dining back. Taxi driver thinks we're Catholic, gives us a lift. We get our smoke in there, no drama. I'm 17 at the time, less than a year out of school and still looking for work. Wednesday consisted of me begging for a few quid off my mom for lunch on my job search, then spending the day in a pub that we would get served at because one of my lads was second cousins with the barman. Those were the days they were getting band jacked and then stumbling back to one of our parents' houses to listen to records until they kicked us out. The great stuff. Point being, I was regular in this one pub and Ravenhill people knew my face there. 
I used to think that was a good thing. Turns out that there was a bad side to it too. Because one day, these blokes walk into the pub, and immediately we know something is dodgy, because they walk straight past the barn into the center of the room. The scanning of the tables which are backed against the walls looking for someone, and it turned out that someone was me and Stacy. They walked up to us, leaned over the table, and then in these hushed voices, they put the fear of God into me. Say five little words that made me want to throw up. Jimmy McNamara wants to see you. I've changed some names here to protect the innocent, but let's just say the bloke I've named Jimmy was a feared senior member of the Ulster Defense Association, probably the biggest Protestant paramilitary organization operating at the time. They call him Mad Dog, I'm not even joking, and it was a nickname he'd done more than enough to earn given that he had a reputation as being one of the most brutal to lead violent psychopaths ever to have graced the streets of Belfast. The thing you've got to remember is that the most of these paramilitary groups weren't shy about hurting the same people they claimed to be protecting, and happened on both sides. The IRA kidnapped, tortured, and killed a Catholic mother of eight because they thought she was passing information to the British Army. And the Schenkel Butcher ended up killing two of their brother Protestants because they mistook them for Catholics. You see now why I thought the whole thing was a load of bullocks. The point is, if Jimmy McNamara was really all about defending good Protestants from evil, bloodthirsty Catholics, who had to stuff their devil tails down the back of their trousers, I shouldn't have been soiling myself without having to meet him, which I most definitely was. Me and Stacy were given an address to go to right away, one that only about 20 minutes walked from the pub. There was no point in trying to run or hide. The Uda had people everywhere and the kind of fear they spread among the communities meant you couldn't really blame anyone for giving you up. The kind of punishments they doled out to horrific, and I was always terrified of getting kneecapped for those fortunate enough not to know what that is. Sorry, maybe skip this part if you're a bit squeamish. Kneecapping is where a bloke shoots you in the back of the knee to basically blow your kneecap out. The damage can tend to vary depending on the kind of gun and the kind of bullet. But best case scenario, you're going to have a horrifically painful injury that takes a good long while to recover. From the worst case scenario, you get severe nerve damage and walk with a limp for the rest of your life. Have to have your leg amputated, or you bleed to death because everyone's too scared to call you an ambulance. And if you really, really annoyed the paramilitaries that shoot you in the ankles and elbows too, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you how claustrophobic that can be for any future Olympic gymnasts out there. Those kinds of punishment shootings were sickeningly common when I was a lad, so as you can imagine, I was scared out of my wits. It was a good thing me and Stacy had a pint or two down us, otherwise I don't think we'd ever had the courage to face our fate like man. After we had the address and the blokes walked off, we just nicked our pints, walked out of the pub, and started walking off in the direction of what we assumed was going to be an Uda safe house. A lot of neighborhoods have places like that abandoned houses that a group used as a weapon cache or a place to hide out from the cops. Sometimes the house didn't even need to be abandoned. Blokes with guns marched into your gothic, told you what was what, you didn't dare say a word on the contrary. And so, after a walk that felt like it went on forever, we finally get to the house and knock on the door. At first, the bloke who answers doesn't seem to know why we're there, and we were made to sit in the wooden floor of the room that looked like it was in the process of being redecorated. After a while, two blokes start coming down the stairs, and when they walk in the room, I see one of them is Jimmy McNamara. You two upstairs now, he says to us, and we didn't dare disobey. Once we reach the top of the stairs, Jimmy and his maid separate me and Stacy into different bedrooms, which again, are totally bare room where the windows are covered up with newspaper. Sit, Jimmy says, that he and his power leave me alone for a moment. Before both reappear at a time, I risk behind my back and my ankles to the chair. I was shaking so badly when the other fellow was tying my hands. He started talking to me like he was an uncle or something. I'll not that bad. Calm down. 
Jimmy just wants to talk. Be honest and you'll be fine, as a good lad. That kind of weird fatherly tone knocks me sick even today, knowing what they were planning and what kind of people they were. I mean, they really were psychopaths to think that they could go around acting like that and still be the good guys. After that, I'm left alone again. Alone in this barely lit, absolutely bargain room, with nothing that keep me company but the stink of my own sweat and fear. After a while, Jimmy walks back into the room alone and shuts the door behind him. He stares at me for a solid minute or so, just in complete silence. There was no soul behind his eyes at all. They were just dead. He looked like a man who never slept. Do you know who I am? He asked me. I just not good. He said that saves us some time. Here's the crack. I'm going to ask you some questions now, and you're going to answer them honestly. Is that clear? I nod again. What were you doing the other day in a Finian taxi going over to Airdyne there? Yes, I'm completely and utterly trapped by the question. The one thing you, that you noted all the different paramilitary groups was their disdain for drug dealers and drug users. If I admit that I was looking to buy drugs, I'll be shot, no questions asked. But if I lie and tell him something else, he might think I'm a Republican or that I'm at least working with them. I was scared out of my mind in no fit state to make a rational decision. So I lied. I told them that I was looking at buying a guitar from the Wii shop there. Then I knew I shouldn't have been spending money in Catholic shops. I was really sorry and I never do it again. Blah, 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 all our lives. Jimmy was a violent, psychopathic thug, but he was good at his job and he knew a lie when he heard one. He just sighed and shook his head, walked over to the wall and banged on it three times. Immediately after he does so, I just hear someone screaming bloody murder from the next room, like a horrible blood-curdling scream for a moment, and then silence. Then another scream, silence, and repeat ad nauseum. Hear that? And Jimmy said to me, pacing around the room like a disappointed head teacher. At your pal in there, taking electric shocks, he lied too, and listened to him. Stacy laid out a particularly pained cry of pure agony, and Jimmy actually smiled when he heard it. So unless he wants your bullocks rigged up to a rovery battery, I suggest you stop telling fibs and that I had told him everything. I told him about the smoke, the taxi company, the bloke selling everything. It all just came out in this big stream of consciousness. When I was done, Jimmy banged on the wall again. The screaming stopped. See? He said, wasn't so hard, wasn't good lad, let's go see a friend. Jimmy then walked out of the room and I'm left alone again. At this point, I know I'm up the creek and what's worse, I've basically grasped Stacy up to who keeps his tongue keeps his friends and all that. I like to think of myself as a bit of a hard case, hanging around pubs or banging heads at gigs, but as I'm tied to that chair waiting on some horrendous corporal punishment that I'm unlikely to ever fully recover from. I just start crying like a wee baby. Then out of nowhere, I'm completely silenced by a gunshot coming from the other room. Stacy screams out in agony and falls quiet again. And for the first time since I was a child, I actually just peed myself right there. And then Jimmy Nunez Powell come back in the room announcing that Stacy has had his punishment. And then once I've had mine, we'll have to hop down the street to a pub that Jimmy will call an ambulance to the way he used that word hop just so casually. It was horrific. How relaxed he was while talking about kneecapping, about maiming another human being for life. Just too scared to do anything but cooperate as they start to untie me, fight back and make a run for it and I'm a dead man for certain. Do as I'm told, and I'll be shot in the back of the knee. And again, they start using that sickening fatherly tone one of them used before telling me the punishment is for my own good. Smoking hash is bad for me, and how they'll be helping me out in the long run. Be a good lad. Keep still. It'll be over for you. Not one of them said as they held me down the floor. I felt the barrel of the gun on the back of my leg, and I burst into tears. It was an actual nightmare that I couldn't wake up from, 
These blokes acting like they were trying to take care of me was making it all more disturbing. Artson, brace yourself, Jimmy said, before starting the countdown of three, two, one. By the time he got the one, I was just screaming, like gritting my teeth and letting out this growl to try to counteract the fear and approaching agony. Then click. Nothing. Jimmy pulls the trigger, and nothing happens. No pain. No blood. Nothing. Stand up, Jimmy says. I do as I'm told. Look me in the eye when I'm talking to you. I try, but he can't. I try, but I can't. So he carries on anyway. Consider this a fair warning, he says, and holds up the pistol. Next time, this will be loaded. I'll get out. Next thing, me and Stacy are walking back to the pub in a state of pure shock, just like they tricked me with the fake punishment routine. They tricked him too, only they really had used electric shocks on him after he lied the first time. Even showed me the wee burns on his ankle where the bloke had touched the wires. I think that was the first time I really questioned whether or not I had a future in Northern Ireland. If I really wanted my life to be defined by thugs and soldiers, bullets and bombs, didn't take me long to work out that I didn't, and run a pub in England now, some corporate place with plastic Irish sensibility, but it puts food on my family's table and I'm happy there. I thought I might move the family back home once things died down, but there were just too many bad memories for me now. Things I'd rather leave behind, that in the fact that the bloke who subjected me to one of the most traumatic things in my entire life is just free to walk the streets. Lots of people escaped justice as part of various ceasefire agreements that brought peace in the six counties. And Jimmy McNamara was one of them. And Amita Garn. But I just couldn't live in a place where blokes like that have just gotten away with the crimes that committed people who have so much blood on their hands that the US pint glass have to be washed twice. I get that many people do that. People have chosen to just live with the legacy of the troubles that me I just couldn't do it. Too much blood. Too many ghosts. Too many monsters that I don't have to hide in the dark anymore.